I see two two really big problems that Bitcoin has to solve. Uh -huh. um, one of them is privacy, and one of them is scalability. Wallet Wasabi coming soon. Welcome, 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 baby people. It's another Cyber Funk 101 session. Today we have Ethan Hellman with us. Hi, Ethan. Hi. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing pretty well. It's a yeah. it's a nice Saturday. We survived the 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 bomb cyclone that was uh, hitting Boston. So. Oh, it's really cold out there right now. I guess. Uh, there was a the big there was a big storm. It caused a bunch of uh, fires, but it's all it's all done now. A storm, okay, because I know there's something going up in the UK right now. Emma, <laughs> I didn't know stuff was happening in the US. All right, so let's get into it. Uh, on here, we basically try to stick to BitB lingo, which is Bitcoin UB lingo. So everything that's going to be explained today, as usual, guys, is going to be easy to understand. Okay. All right. So, Ethan, give us a little bit about your background, your hobbies, what you did before Bitcoin, etc. Tell us about yourself. Sure. So, I was um, I was a software engineer, general computer person for um, uh, many years. Um, I did uh, uh, two startups. I did some um, bioinformatics work, um, uh, visualizing some of the um, like genes and and uh, genomes on um, microbes. Um, and then I did this uh, startup called um, PubGet, which was a, a life science uh, search engine. Um, and I worked on that for about three years, uh, we ended up getting acquired. And while I was um, working there, I was really into cryptography and I'd always been into this idea of, um, of fixing uh, many of the things that are broken about the current financial system. Um, okay. and just having like a, like, like self-sovereign coins that have anonymity and um, don't have any of the traditional problems associated with credit cards where like, your secret number is stored on a server somewhere. That server gets hacked. All of a sudden, you owe all the money. All your money is gone, right? Right. Uh -huh. So I heard about Bitcoin, um, and I actually looked looked in my emails a while ago. Uh, and the first time I, I I talked to someone about Bitcoin was 2009, um, but I didn't understand uh -huh. it very well. I was like uh -huh. very much like a, a newbie, um, but I was very excited about it. Um, so at my work, uh, I had the Bitcoin white paper. I like stuck it on a magnet on the refrigerator, um, at, at my office. So everyone saw it and I was always talking about it. Um, and after we got acquired, I decided to go back to grad school to work on both like cryptography, but also cryptocurrencies full time. Um, oh, so it was, okay. It was about four years ago. Um, and my like going away letter said something like like we expect to see you on the street corner standing on like a soapbox like yelling about bitcoin um <laughs> and i think that's i think that's pretty, 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 pretty <laughs> everybody's like bitcoin so, bitcoin get your bitcoin yeah yeah i had the, i had the white paper i was like super super excited about it uh -huh. um uh so i went i went i went i went to grad school um and uh, me and my PhD advisor, I ended up uh, getting her involved in Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. Um, we just actually published a paper um, uh, uh, like two days ago um, okay, on uh, some networking with Ethereum. So we ended up getting a big group of uh, people excited about blockchains and Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies at Boston University. And so that like Ethan impact is happening. <laughs> yeah. When I say when I say BU, I mean Boston University, not Bitcoin Unlimited. Um, <laughs> okay. uh, so um, I've been there um, for about four years doing um, cryptocurrency research, um, mm -hmm. both on the privacy side and on um, uh, some of the sort of more plumbing side of Bitcoin that's not talked about, like um, how blocks are communicated and what. Uh -huh. uh, a malicious party could do by messing with that network. Um, and then I recently um, 
took a leave of absence and me and my PhD advisor founded a company, um, Commonwealth Crypto, um, which is looking at uh, trying to improve um, uh, the security around uh, cryptocurrency exchanges. So when you sell um, Litecoin to buy some Bitcoin, um, how can we make that process more secure? More secure and easier, I hope, for people like <laughs> me. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Okay. So what really triggered your involvement? What was that? Was it an article or for a friend you heard? What did, what started that trigger? Um, Do you remember? So I took, I took this class, um, I think it was in like maybe 2008 or 2009 mm -hmm. um, on, on, crypt, on like cryptography and hacking and that sort of thing. And they brought up this old line of research called eCash. Um, and I got very excited about it. And the idea with eCash was it was like a centralized bank, but it could issue money um, in such a way that it could, uh, that that money would be anonymous even from the bank. And so I got really excited about this, this idea. And I went around and I sort of naively assumed that, of course, there would be people running eCash banks uh, around like <laughs> around, around that time period. And oh, it was no. like, no. And I, I started thinking about like, well, like, why, why didn't this take off? And it seemed to me that the biggest issue is trust. The bank can't mm -hmm. violate your privacy, um, but if the bank disappears tomorrow, you can never turn your like e-coin back into, um, uh, you can't cash. In, into any sort of hard, hard currency and it requires this trusted party. Mm -hmm. um, so when Bitcoin came out, I was really excited about it um, because uh, I was, I was on like um, a lot of the mailing lists, so I, I heard about it fairly early, and right. I was like, it solved it solved this problem, and maybe a little bit. Um, I, I I thought it would be neat, but I also didn't really have the time to investigate it in any sort of detail. So um, I, I I I thought it was cool, and I like read the white paper, but I didn't fully understand the white paper. All right. it, took, it took a little while. It wasn't it wasn't really until I. Um, uh, started started grad school in um, uh, 2013 um, that I really like understood. Understood what was happening. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I understand. Um, I was made to understand that you're one of the main developers of Tumblebit. I helped um, design uh, Tumblebit, um, and I was very much involved in the uh, research project. Um, okay. And uh, 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 another researcher who is at um, BU, who is an undergraduate at the time, um, actually wrote most of the Tumblebit proof of concept. Um, uh, Lean, um, her name's on the uh, paper we ended up releasing. Um, and I wrote some of the proof of concept um, uh, near the end. Uh, to get it ready for its its final test. But what is it? Tell us oh, what, so is what is it. it? <laughs> right. uh, but I just want to be clear that uh, most of and Tumblebit, um, the the programming has been um, other parties like uh, Adam and Nicholas Dorier. Right. Um, so the idea with Tumblebit is a way of. Um, well, actually, there's two ideas with Tumblebit. Okay. The first idea is, um, in in Bitcoin, um, when you uh, when you spend money, everyone can see the Bitcoin address that you spent from and the Bitcoin right. address that you spent to, and so all of this history is public. Um, so this isn't really great from a um, currency use case point of view because people often don't want say their neighbors seeing knowing um, their business what, their what financial purchase. business yeah right um so one of the technologies that's been um employed to try to uh claw back some of this privacy is um known as uh, mixers or tumblers where you spend to the service um, and a large number of people spent to the service, and then you spend out of the service, and it breaks that link um, between your um, current address and your past address, um, so that 
someone that looks at your current address can't um, trace back the history to your past address. Let's try to break this down a little more. You said sure, sure. if I spend in, right? Let's right. say I send in five bucks. It goes into a pool of some sort. Right. Where everybody else is. But somewhere in there, what happens at the other end? So it's like um um imagine if uh so dollar bills have a uh uh like cash has a serial number on it, right? Serial number, yes, it does. Uh huh. Um, and so, if someone writes down that serial number and gives you um, cash, then when you spend that cash, someone else can inspect the serial number and see where you got it from. Right. Um, but imagine everyone um, gets together and everyone puts like one dollar in a in a in a pot. Right. Um, and then everyone takes one dollar from that pot. Um you're likely to end up with a serial number that's different than the one you put in. Oh, yes, that makes you'll sense. Uh -huh. break that, you'll break that ability to um, use the serial number to sort of match where that money went from. Um, oh, OK. All right. So you're still working on that right now, <laughs> or let that be? Um, so I'm still very excited about um, uh, privacy in um, Bitcoin. Right. Um, we've uh, published the the Tumblebit um, paper. Um, it has been implemented as um, N Tumblebit, um, and uh, uh, Nicholas Nicholas Dorier has been like writing code and um, there's some commits. Um, I'm uh, I'm working on uh, other research. Um, I think I'm gonna uh, circle back to it. Also, oh, you've left that, put it down for a little bit, and yeah. then you're looking at other things right now. That was actually my next question. You know, what's going to happen later on? What can we look forward to with you? You just said that you released a paper with your professor recently. What else? So a lot of the techniques that are used in Tumblebit um, are are usable generally in the cryptocurrency and Bitcoin space. Um, and so we've been looking at uh, other places that we can use those techniques. Um, so we, 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 we founded a company recently. Um, so, I guess, so I guess a lot of this work, um, there's, this, there's this notion of a layer above the blockchain, often called uh, off blockchain. Um, okay, what's that? Uh, so what's that yeah, entail? Yeah. What? What does that entail, the layer above or the off blockchain? So the layer above the blockchain is um is things which are secured by the blockchain but can happen without um uh always interacting with the blockchain. So one of the big um one of the big challenges that uh scaling Bitcoin faces is that writing to a blockchain takes a long time and can be very expensive. Yeah. Um, okay. So you want to create protocols that the blockchain secures, but that you can send money without, without writing to the blockchain. Um, the most well-known one of those protocols is the Lightning Network. Okay, and that is? Um, uh, so this is a way of sending money um, that is uh, sending bitcoins that is secured by the blockchain, um, but essentially you open an account on the blockchain, um, and you can send money to other people that have opened an account. Um, however, the actual payments um, don't need to be written to the blockchain, and then say at the end of the month you can um, write that balance to the blockchain. Mm. Um, okay, I like to picture things. Let's try to. Paint a picture. So basically, I have to write out the amount that I want to send to a particular block in a particular block, right? Or when I write it out, it goes to a block. So um, at a at a at a very high level, the way the Lightning Network works mm -hmm. um, is that it's like you. Um, put your Bitcoins in, in an escrow. Um, 
and this is called uh, opening a channel. So the idea is that okay. you you like lock your bitcoins away, right? In in such a way that um, you can um, change the change the balance. So you can so me and you can lock bitcoins together in like a joint account, okay. and that joint account can only be updated if both of us agree to that update. Ah, uh, okay. Um, and then we can basically write, like, I can write a statement that's saying, like, I agree to give one Bitcoin to you. And using cryptography, that agreement is enforceable on the blockchain. Um, so then I can send money to you. And each one of those payments does not actually have to um, be reflected in the blockchain. But the, but the very last payment, when you want to take that money out of the escrow, you do the right. last balance. And then you say, like, we both agreed to this. Um, and uh, it's blockchain enforceable, so neither one of us can cheat the other. So we can um, check, keep each other in check, basically. Right. Okay, that's fair enough. So, another question. What do you think of confidential transactions and bulletproof? You are free to explain these terminologies in your own words. Sure. Um, so uh, confidential transactions, well, let me, let me go back to Bitcoin. So um, if uh, Alice sends Bob money in Bitcoin, let's say mm -hmm. Alice sends Bob five Bitcoins, everyone can inspect, inspect the blockchain and see that Alice sent Bob five Bitcoins. Right. Um, and this is actually a, a, a really big privacy problem because because you can't do that on an average basis. You can't go to the bank and find out what's in Ethan's account, you know? Right. Um, so even if you don't know um, who who Bob is, you could look at the price of the item that Alice conceivably purchased and try to, like, match it to, to things that Alice, Alice bought. Um, and so this this fact that the amount is public is a very big, uh, is a very big privacy concern. And so confidential transactions is designed um, so that the amount is uh, not public. So Bob knows how much he got paid and Alice knows how much he paid Bob, but um, no one other than Alice and Bob knows see. Uh, how much it was, it was paid. Um, right. And um, this actually relies on um, the, 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 this technique um, is fairly simple. But it has one problem, which is and that, that is? Um, so the problem is it's a little bit it's a little bit complicated. But the problem is that um, let's say uh, Alice pays Bob and Carol. You want to make sure that the amount that she's paying them is actually the amount that she has, since no one can inspect how much. Uh, since no one other than Bob and Carol can <clears throat> tell how much Alice paid. She could just be like, oh, I paid Bob a million dollars. And um, that's that's not actually the case. So you you right. need a way of ensuring that Alice is actually paying um, uh, money. That, that she the amount paying. is what she has and what she has spent <clears throat> and what Bob has received. That's right. It. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a, and, and this would be a very dangerous thing if it was, um, if she could just essentially print money this way. Because now Bob would have a million dollars that came from somewhere, and then he could spend <laughs> right. that to someone else. And um, so, a money launderer's dream. <laughs> so you you have to have a, a and and there's some 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 more technical details about how this works that I'm that I'm not explaining. That um, if your viewers are really interested in, they can they can dig in uh, more in depth. Um, right. But uh, fundamentally, the way that you prevent this from happening is you use a um, a, um, you use something called a range proof, um, and a range proof proves that I have a number and I'm going to encrypt the number and I'm going to show you the encrypted number. And then I'm going to prove to you that the number that I encrypted without revealing anything else about that number is between like zero and a thousand. Oh, okay. Um, and so this is this is um, there's 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 been a lot of work in cryptography on doing this, and it's there's some really cool protocols for doing this. 
Um, but the original motivation was that um, imagine you want to go, or imagine someone's going to a bar and um, they will often um, check your age to make sure that you're of age for drinking. Um, so uh, cryptographers in the early 1990s wanted a way that you could prove that you were old enough to drink without revealing your age. Um, and so they invented this mechanism that they thought people would use that no one ended up using, which was a way to prove that you're old enough to drink without, at, without revealing your age. How? So you, so you encrypt your age and then you perform this range proof that proves that your age is like greater than 21. Between 21 and a certain number. Um, and so it uses this technique called zero knowledge proofs. And they thought that like this would be deployed on everyone's like, like ID cards, where right? all your information on your ID card would be encrypted. And when someone wanted to check something, you would only reveal the information necessary to, um, you would only that prove- That particular situation. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, but these proof techniques are, are somewhat complicated and they just never got widespread adoption. So, um, uh, so these techniques ended up getting used in confidential transactions, um, and uh, many of the researchers doing confidential transactions invented sort of like better. Um, uh, since a lot of these techniques were fairly old, they invented like more efficient ways of doing this. Okay. Um, Faster, so, less memory, and whatnot. Right, um, and the biggest problem is that. If I make a transaction where I've used confidential transactions to hide the amount, I also need to include the proof in that transaction. Um, and okay. these proofs can be quite large. Um, so I believe the original um, confidential transactions proofs were um, uh, 3,500 bytes around there. Um, and a Bitcoin transaction is 200 bytes. So it was um, like an that really makes the that. whole transaction a lot more than it should be. Right. Okay. Um, so there's been a lot of work in trying to make these proofs much, much smaller. Um, and the most recent effort to do this is, is bullet proofs and bullet proofs appear to, um, bullet proofs have a bunch of, uh, really useful properties, um, that I can explain in more depth. Um, but the one takeaway is that bullet proofs make it so that it is um, almost reasonable to use confidential transactions in like actual practice. Um, okay. So this, do you see this is where the future of Bitcoin is going in terms of the privacy and memory and usage? Um, so I think it's, it's, uh, it's definitely like one way, uh, one direction Bitcoin can go in. Um, and okay. it's a way that I would really like to see happen. Um, I, I, I can't really like, it, it would be a very radical change for Bitcoin to make. Um, and Bitcoin has been fairly conservative in its changes. Um, so I don't, I don't think we're there yet for, um, for Bitcoin. Um, but maybe on a much like longer, like on a like five to 10 year time scale. Um, okay. I definitely see this technology being um, adopted, but it's probably not going to be the next thing that ends up in Bitcoin. Really? Okay, but in terms oh, that's, of that's my opinion, um, I am I am not a Bitcoin core dev. Uh, Bitcoin core devs they feel differently about the priorities. Um, uh, but I I should explain that I'm I'm coming from the the networking and network security world, uh -huh. um, and in the network security world, things take a really long time. Um, uh, Segwit is sort of like it. Segwit is like it took two years, but like DNSSEC, uh, the security for a uh, security protocol for um, uh, DNS, which is how uh, when you type in Google.com, it finds Google.com, um, has been like discussed and under development for like fifteen years. Um, Whoa. Uh, <laughs> okay. The, in the network security thing world, time. things move very slowly. And so I tend to be um, uh, conservative when I imagine protocol adoption. Ah, uh, okay. Well, <laughs> I do hope that in the future, I would be able to use this as 
easily as possible because the way I see it, it's just complicated. And I, I watch others doing their coding, like Adam, and it just looks like gibberish at the moment. And I'm like, how are we supposed to be able to use this if it's supposed to be made for us later on? When is it going to get to that stage? Because <laughs> it's a good idea, a good concept, but it's just too complicated right now. <laughs> yeah. So if you see, like, you sound more reasonable in the sense that, you know, five to 10 years, maybe, just maybe. Yeah. All right. Okay. Anything else you'd like to add? Anyone? Shout out. Oh, uh, no, thanks. Uh, you're see, good? I'm trying to. I'm I'm bad at coming up with 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 uh, I'm bad at coming up with my own questions. <laughs> it's all questions. Any things you like to put out there? Like you wanna you hope to see from a particular startup or whatnot? I mean, I I see privacy. I see two two really big problems that Bitcoin has to solve. Uh -huh. um, one of them is privacy, and one of them is scalability. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that they're actually related problems um, because the problem with scalability is that everyone has to see everything that everyone else is doing. And the problem with privacy is that everyone is seeing what everyone else is everyone doing. Is doing. <laughs> um, and so like, I, I think that there's actually like a lot of, um, I, I'm very hopeful that we can solve these two problems together um, because they, they seem like they're actually the same problem in some deep sense. Yes, I get what you're saying. Yeah, there's a lot of push and pull in, in some way. You need to get those things together yeah. eventually. All right. Thank you, Ethan, for your time. Hopefully, who knows, in the future, we could have another in-depth conversation about all the other things that you couldn't get to this time around. Thank you. Cyberfunks people, Bitbees, we're out. Wallet Wasabi, coming soon.